Let's get to our questions. 71. Philip wants to learn Russian to impress Natalia, a girl in his class. Philip searches for Russian vocabulary words on YouTube. He will repeat the word he hears and then try to match it to a picture of lunch items. Tomorrow, he is going to try to use some of the words he knows to order his lunch in front of Natalia. If he is able to do this, he would have demonstrated what? This is a stimulus equivalence question. This is when we're talking about typically matching the sample, right? A equals A, A equals B, B equals, equals A, and then A equals B equals C, therefore C equals A. If we look at our answer choices, we have reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. Self-monitoring is not part of stimulus equivalence. Reflexivity, of course, is A equals A. Symmetry is going to be the A equals B, B equals A, and then transitivity will be A equals B equals C, C equals A. So we need to determine what is Philip demonstrating. So when you get a question like this, letter the different stimuli or responses in the question. It will help, okay? So first, Philip looks for Russian vocabulary words on YouTube and repeats the word he hears. That's going to be A. He then tries to match it to a picture of lunch items, which is B. The word matching to the picture of lunch items, A equals B, the picture equal the, equals the word, B equals A. And then tomorrow, he's going to use the word, which is A, to match it to order his actual food in front of Natalia, which is C. So if he is able to do this, what did he demonstrate? Well, he's going to demonstrate that A equals B equals C, and then C equals A. He's going to demonstrate transitivity. Richie is attempting to run a six-minute mile. Every morning, he wakes up and runs for an hour. He tracks his runs and graphs the data using his watch. He then takes the graph data and compares it to data he found online from other runners going after the same goal. What concept of self-management is Richie using? When thinking about self-management, avoid thinking about self-control. That's the trap people fall into. Self-control is a misnomer. What controls behavior? The environment. So instead, we want to use these tangible terms they give us, things like self-monitoring, self-evaluation, self-instruction. In this case, what is Richie doing? Well, he's running. He's tracking his run. He's then taking that data and comparing it to other individuals. So is he monitoring himself? Is he evaluating himself? Is he delivering self-instruction? Is he delivering self-reinforcement? Well, he's not delivering instruction, right? He's not instructing himself to do whatever it is. He's just running. There's no self-reinforcement going on, okay? We're not sure whether or not this function is a reinforcer. Either way, he's just comparing himself to other runners. So now we're doing self-monitoring and self-evaluation. What's going to be the better answer here? Now, have if Richie had just stopped right at the data, maybe we go with self-monitoring. But what did he do? He took that he took that data and actually compared it to other people online. He's evaluating his progress. He's evaluating himself against others. Richie is using self-evaluation. Remember, we want the best answer. Okay, the most common thing you hear is. All the questions, two answers looked right. That's how the test is set up. They want you to identify the best answer because they want you to use all the information given, not just some of it. Richie is really self-evaluating himself by comparing his data against others. So our answer here is B. 73, Tammy is wedding dress shopping with her mom, aunt, and best friends. Tammy and the group are sitting on a bench drinking champagne while her mom holds up a dress and asks what the group thinks of each dress. Her mom does this for several dresses in a row. What type of preference assessment is the mom conducting? What is our trick to preference assessment? Ask yourself, at that time, how many stimuli are being assessed? We're not thinking of total stimuli, right? Because you can have 100 stimuli and do a single stimulus assessment. You can have 100 stimuli and do forced choice. You can have only three and do a multiple stimulus. So we're thinking in the moment, how many are we, assess are we assessing? If we're assessing one individual stimuli, it's going to be single stimulus. If we're assessing two at that, that point, it's going to be forced choice. If we're assessing three or more at that point, it's going to be multiple stimulus. So what is Tammy and her group doing? Well, her mom is holding up one dress. What does the group think of each dress? holding up another dress, what does the group think of each dress, on and on and on. 
how many stimuli or stimulus at a time. It's going to be one. Her mom is conducting a simple single stimulus preference assessment. You want to use a whole interval data collection method to track in-seat behavior, remaining seated, for a client in a fourth grade classroom. Each class lasts approximately 30 minutes. Which of the following choices will be the most appropriate way to set up the recording system? Kind of a multi-part question. We need to set up the system, and then we need to determine the best way to implement the system. So first things first, we're using a whole interval data collection method. And this is why I say you need to spend a lot of time reading the question and understanding the, understanding the information, or else a question like this could take a long time. Because if we look at our answer choices, they all look very similar. So if you rush through the question, jump to the answer choices, you're almost definitely going to need to go back and reread the question. Spend time up front on the question, understanding all the information. We know we have a whole interval data collection method. We know each class lasts 30 minutes. So in your mind, you should already be thinking, how am I going to set up the system? A, break the 30 minutes into 31 minute intervals. So far, so good. If the client remains in his chair for some of the interval, recorded as correct. All right, that's a mistake. We're using whole interval. We're not worried if he remains for some of the interval. He needs to remain the entire interval. So A is not going to cut it. B, break 30 minutes into 31 minute intervals. Okay, so far, so good. If the client remains in his chair for the entire minute, record it as correct. Perfect. That will be a great way to collect this whole interval data. The interval is reasonable. You're going to get a lot of data points. Okay. You're utilizing that whole time. It's discontinuous. It has all the aspects. What about C? Break the 30 minutes into five minute intervals. If the client remains in his chair for the entire minute, record it as correct. All right. What's going to be better? Is it going to be this one minute interval or this five minute interval? So with discontinuous interval collection, the rule of thumb is you typically want shorter intervals when available. The reason is you want it reasonable. Let's say this child can sit in his, in his chair, okay, for a minute every now and then. So one minute is going to be perfect. But if you stretch that interval to five minutes, there's no way he's getting to that point. Okay, you're, you're clearly trying to increase this behavior. Five minutes is a long time if you're trying to increase this behavior. Okay, plus you're going to get more data if we get these 31 minute intervals. If we get five minute intervals, what if he sits in his chair for four and a half minutes? Well, five minute intervals, that's going to be a non response. That is really going to underestimate the behavior. The rule of thumb is the more intervals, the better. And you want the intervals to be reasonable to give you significant and accurate enough data. Remember, discontinuous measurement is already somewhat inaccurate, okay, due to the short time span. The shorter interval is going to help with that and give you a little more accurate data. B is going to be better than C. And then D, every minute look up and check to see if your client is seated in their chair. That is momentary time sampling. So B is going to be our best answer. 75, Slash plays guitar in a band with his friends. They perform every Friday and Saturday at local clubs. Last night, Slash played the wrong chord on one of his solos. The next day at practice, Slash intentionally played the wrong chord during that solo 15 times in a row. What was Slash engaging in? If you perform the incorrect behavior over and over and over again, what is that called? That is negative practice. If you perform the correct behavior, let's say throwing a piece of trash in the trash can and you do that over and over again, Positive practice. Very straightforward. So what did Slash do? Did he play the right behavior, the right chord? Or did he play the wrong behavior, the wrong chord? He played the wrong chord 15 times in a row. Is it positive practice? No, we are looking at negative practice. What is restitutional overcorrection? It's when you restore the environment to a better shape than what it was in. And of course, this is not negative reinforcement. This is negative practice overcorrection. Matt is an adult with an intellectual disability working as a cashier at the local diner in his town. Matt is very friendly and loves to greet customers. Sometimes, Matt will greet customers more than once. Matt's boss tells Matt that if he greets customers only once, he will receive a small bonus on his paycheck. What intervention is Matt's boss using? All right. Differential reinforcement question. What are we trying to do? Trying to reduce this behavior. Now, 
are we teaching a replacement behavior? No. Okay. What can we eliminate? We can immediately eliminate DRA and DRI. It's a quick way to eliminate answer choices on DR questions. Are you teaching a replacement behavior? Yes or no. If you are, then you're eliminating DRO and DRL, which don't teach replacement behaviors. Okay. Make this thing easy on yourself. Make it easy on yourself. Okay. So we're left with DRL and DRO. With DRO, what are we doing? We're reinforcing anytime the behavior is not occurring. Do we want this behavior to go away? No, we just want it to reduce. We want him to stop greeting them so much. Just greet them appropriately. One time is enough. What intervention is he using? Of course, a DRL, where we're trying to lower that behavior to a reasonable, socially valid amount, but we're not trying to get rid of it. 77. A team of researchers at UNLV recently discovered a method of teaching a foreign language rapidly to elementary school students who participated in the study. However, they have not been able to implement it effectively anywhere else. Their study currently lacks what? What's the most important part of this question? Start pausing and thinking about, is this relevant, is it not? We're looking for what the study lacks. This, however, okay, is a key because they discover this method, right? And it works but they can't implement it anywhere else. When you fail to duplicate or replicate or implement your experiment outside of the experimental environment, what is that considered? Well, of course, you're failing to generalize or you're lacking external validity. Internal validity deals to, with the extraneous, var extraneous variables and confounds within the experiment. Do you actually have control? Do the researchers actually have control over the foreign language? Apparently they do. They just cannot generalize it outside of that environment. Again, external validity involves generalization to the outside environment. Internal validity, look, look, you're looking inside your environment. Do you actually have control over the behavior? Credibility. Credibility is not one of our terms. Measurability. They can clearly measure it. They just need to figure out a way to get it to work elsewhere. Their study currently lacks external validity. 78. Dave is at the ballpark with his friends Willie and Jackie. Willie asks Jackie, who is going to win today? Jackie says, I think the Mets. Meanwhile, Babe sees the hot dog vendor and says, hot dogs. Babe engaged in what type of opera? All right, behavior questions. They're not going to make behavior questions easy on you. All right, you're going to need to identify whose behavior am I worried about and what is that behavior? We have Jackie and Willie talking. Jackie says, who's going to win today? Jackie says, I think the Mets. What type of operant is that? It's clearly an introverbal, right? Evoked by a verbal SD, no point-to-point -point correspondence, conversational, introverbal. We're not worried about them, though. We're worried about Babe. The question asks, Babe engaged in what type of operant? What does Babe do? Babe sees the hot dog vendor and says, hot dogs. Okay. Was his behavior evoked by a verbal SD? No, a non-verbal SD. So we can eliminate an introverbal. We can eliminate an echoic. We now have a manned and attacked. Did Babe request for the hot dog or did he just see the hot dog and say hot dog? He just saw the hot dog and labeled it. Okay, you got to be very careful here. Babe just saw the hot dog and he said hot dog. That is a tact. Okay. Doesn't seem there's any motivating operation in play. Attack is evoked by a nonverbal SD. What is what Babe did? He labeled the hot dogs. Babe engaged in a attack. That's what you need to be able to do for verbal operant on the exam. What evokes it, what doesn't, what reinforces it, etc. 79. You conduct parent training with each client once a week. At your most recent meeting, your client asks you to explain the new behavior plan. What would be the most appropriate explanation? Okay, so when we get these type of questions, we should immediately start thinking non-technical language, no jargon, language they can understand, but keep it behavior analytic. That's what you need to remember. Let's go through it. Hey, we're using a differential reinforcement of other behavior intervention paired with a high P, low P request sequence. Don't do this, okay? We don't need to show off how much we know to parents. We need the parents to understand what we're saying. Nobody outside of ABA is going to really understand differential reinforcement or a high P, low P request sequence, okay? We need to do a better job explaining it to them. 
Whenever the client becomes tired or frustrated, they act out, which is why we have the behavior plan. Definitely avoid this. Okay? We are not using these constructs, these hypothetical constructs or the explanatory fiction to explain away behavior. We need to still, in layman's terms, be behavioral, be objective, be measurable. C, we want to make sure we aren't giving attention to the behavior we are trying to change and that we are rewarding the new behavior. Perfect. What are we describing? We're describing extinction. We're describing reinforcement, but in a way that everybody understands. Everybody knows what attention is. Everyone knows what rewards are. Perfect. Okay. C is much better than B and A. And then D, the new behavior plan takes effect tomorrow. We should see results we want within two weeks. I would not advise guaranteeing results. Okay. We can't guarantee anything. ABA is a long process. It's ongoing. Never guarantee results. The most appropriate explanation would be C. We want to make sure we aren't giving attention to the behavior we are trying to change and that we are rewarding new behavior. And then 80, a chore chart is utilized at the ABA clinic you work for to make sure that the clinic is sanitized and cleaned at the end of each day. Every RBT is given a task to complete. Only once all tasks are done, the RBTs can leave for the day. What type of contingency is this? All right. Group contingency, right? We have all the RBTs involved. <clears throat> you want to make sure the clinic is clean. What is the contingency? That's what you're looking for. Once all tasks are done, the RBTs can leave for the day. If each RBT is given a task to complete, okay, who needs to complete their task? Are we worried about one RBT completing their task? Are we worried about each individual RBT completing their task? Or are we worried about the entire team? Well, we're worried about the entire team. It doesn't matter how fast I do my task. If all the tasks aren't done, we can't leave. Okay. So I need to either need to go and help these, these other RBTs, okay, or they need to do their job quickly. So if we're reliant on the whole group to complete or engage in the behavior, are we looking independent, interdependent, or dependent? Independent is you're reliant on yourself. Once you're done, you're done. Dependent is the hero. We're, we're reliant on one person or a select few. Interdependent is what we're looking for. When the entire group needs to engage in the response to get reinforcement, it is interdependent. 